Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, uh, depending on where you are in the world. Thanks for joining in today's webinar as part of the Cloud Analytics Summit, why you should move your data lake to the cloud. Um, my name is Lorna. I work in our European office with Fivetran. And today, I'm lucky to be joined by our CEO and co-founder, George Fraser. So thanks a million for joining us today, George. Um, it's great to have you. And George is actually based in California right now, so we're on a worldwide um, mix of our offices online. Um, just before we get started and I hand you over to George, um, I just want to let you know you can ask us any questions throughout the presentation in the window of, on your right. Just feel free to type them in and we'll try and address them at the end. Um, and also, you can download the attachment of the presentation deck in attachments on the right-hand side. So without further ado, I'm going to pass you over to George to kick this off. Thanks very much, Lorna. I'm really happy to be with everyone today. Um, as Lorna mentioned, I'm CEO of Fivetran. Uh, Fivetran is a fully managed automated data pipeline that syncs data uh, from all your cloud-based data sources into your data lake. Um, we support uh, the data, uh, a growing list of data sources, including all the ones listed here. Uh, and uh, we have an automated system uh, that knows how to uh, connect to all these data sources and sync the complete data set that exists in them and keep it up to date inside your data lake. Today I'm going to talk to you a bit about data lakes, what they are, um, who they're useful for, how tools like Fivetran fit into them, what kind of best practices we've observed. So a data lake, uh, the term is used to mean a lot of different things. We can, use, we can think of there being a spectrum from a classic Hadoop data lake on one end of the spectrum to a traditional enterprise data warehouse on the other. Um, so on the left side of the spectrum, you might have somebody doing, uh, using Hadoop to do MapReduce on unstructured text. This would be like the most rigid definition of a data lake. If we move down one step, uh, we can think of systems like Amazon Athena. Athena is a tool from AWS that allows you to write SQL queries that natively query semi-structured file formats like CSV and JSON in S3. So it's kind of similar to that Hadoop example, except the data is a little more structured and you don't have to maintain a Hadoop cluster. It's a serverless product that uses a query engine from the Hadoop ecosystem called Presto. Moving one more step down this spectrum, we have the Elastic Data Warehouses. These are systems uh, like BigQuery and Snowflake that differ from traditional data warehouses in that they separate compute from storage. These databases combine the characteristics of data lakes and data warehouses in an especially interesting way. Uh, they allow you to store any amount of data very cheaply and to only pay for what you query. Um, Snowflake and BigQuery can really be a data warehouse or a data lake depending on how you use them. And we're going to spend a bunch of time talking about this usage pattern later. Lastly, you have your traditional data warehouses where you have to plan your compute and storage capacity ahead of time. So returning to the left side of our diagram, in a classic data lake, people often follow a pattern called schema on read. The idea is that you store your raw data in CSV or JSON format, and you don't actually parse the CSVs until someone actually runs a query. Um, this is a really interesting idea. Uh, the problem with this pattern is that parsing CSVs and JSON files is, every time you run a query, is really slow. Uh, the motivation of doing this is good. The idea is that you want to avoid doing a lot of complex ETL processes up front uh, on your data. You want to postpone any difficult, brittle process until later so that it's easier to change. But going all the way from a CSV to a SQL query, every single time you're on a query, I would argue is too extreme. At a very fundamental level, it makes sense to read text formats like CSV and JSON into a more optimized representation so that you don't have to redo this work every single time you run a query. 
At the other end of the spectrum, in a classic enterprise data warehouse, you've got a dimensional schema. Um, the, uh, the idea is that before you load data into your data warehouse, you're going to ETL everything into a highly optimized schema. So this is very much the opposite of storing all your data in CSV and JSON and going all the way from soup to nuts on every query. Instead, we're going to design a very optimized schema that is going to take into consideration the specific queries that we intend to run uh, on our data warehouse. This is going to give you fast queries, and hopefully it's going to give you a schema that's easy for your users to understand. The problem is that you have to do all this work up front before your data warehouse is useful. So there's this huge front-loaded workload of designing the schema and building all these ETL processes uh, that know how to load your data from the way it starts and all the sources into this dimensional schema in your data warehouse. And if your data warehouse needs change later, uh, this data warehouse schema that you spent so much time creating uh, may no longer work for you. It's very analogous to uh, waterfall development uh, with all the associated problems. In between these two extremes is the approach we advocate for at Fivetran, uh, which a lot of people call ELT. The idea is uh, that we're going to um, combine the best qualities of the um, iterative, agile approach of the uh, classic data lakes where you go from soup to nuts on every quarter, uh, on every query, uh, with the faster queries that you get in a traditional data warehouse. Um, so uh, where a classic uh, Hadoop data lake would be very quick to set up, um, but would give you very slow queries, and a classic data warehouse would give you very fast queries, but a huge upfront setup time, we want to design a system that's going to give us fast setup and iterative development and fast queries. And the way that we advocate you accomplish that is this ELT pattern. The key idea is uh, that in, in, in a classic ETL paradigm, shown on the left here, you're doing all of this extensive transformation before we load the data into the data warehouse. This is the extensive setup and maintenance process. That's the whole problem with ETL. On the right, in ELT, we're not going to do this transformation, and we're going to load the data in its native normalized schema. We're going to do simple performance optimizations, like converting CSVs to JSON into a more optimized format. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, keeping your data in CSV and JSON format is probably taking the ELT philosophy too far. Um, but this kind of transformation is safe. It's pretty unlikely that we're later going to regret parsing our CSVs. Um, we, can, we can safely parse our CSVs, parse our JSON into a more optimized format and not worry this is somehow going to cause problems for us down the road. What we're not going to do up front is the really time-consuming, tricky transformations, like converting everything into a dimensional schema. Instead, we're going to do that transformation inside the data warehouse using SQL. So the big idea here is that our data lake and our data warehouse are simply going to be two schemas in the same database. Uh, so by using a system that separates compute from storage, uh, like BigQuery or Snowflake, uh, the cost of storing everything twice is very low. So on the left, uh, we're going to have our data lake schema. And this schema is going to be normalized. The basic idea is that we'll keep the same schema uh, that the data has in the source in the data warehouse. It's going to be organized by source. So that means uh, we'll have all our Salesforce data together. We'll have all our Postgres data together. We'll have all our Pardot data together. Regardless of what kind of information is in these data sources, we'll always keep the data organized um, by the place that it came from. And lastly, uh, the schema on the left is relatively immutable. If we want to make changes to our schema or uh, to the values in the, in the data, um, we're going to do that by keeping the original data unchanged, and we're going to write SQL queries that transform that data into 
an alternative version that we'll store separately. That way, if we make mistakes or if we change our mind later about what the right transformations are to do, we always are still going to have the original data in that data lake schema um, to go back to. On the right, our data warehouse schema is going to be organized differently. It's going to be denormalized to make it more user friendly. Maybe it'll be a star schema. Maybe it'll simply be a bunch of really wide views uh, so that uh, an end user uh, can just go to the view that, they, that is relevant to the question they're trying to ask and see all the different dimensions and measures that are relevant to them. It'll be organized by subject rather than by source. So for example, we might combine lots of different marketing data sources into a single view of marketing activities. And most importantly, this data warehouse schema is constantly going to be changing to adapt to the needs of the business. The day after we find a good dimensional schema to represent the questions that we're trying to answer today, we're going to have a new question, and that schema is going to evolve. Because the data lake schema and the data warehouse schema both live in the same system, it's easy to change the SQL queries that transform one into the other as our needs change. So this architecture at a very fundamental level is going to enable that adaptive, iterative pattern that is the reality of every real world data warehouse. So let's walk through a real world example of doing this pa pattern. This example is uh, an analysis that Fivetran recently did of our own marketing data. So we wanted to get a better picture of how our marketing efforts were reaching our users. Uh, and to get a complete view of what's going on, we needed to combine data about page views on our website, which comes from Snowplow.js, a tracking pixel we use on Fivetran.com. We needed data about demo requests that are stored in Pardot. Um, which even though it's part of the same company as Salesforce, actually has a separate API and a separate data model. We needed information about opportunities and accounts from Salesforce, um, about who was coming in, about who at Fivetran was talking to them, whether opportunities were SDR qualified or AE qualified, that kind of thing. We needed user information from our own production database, which is Postgres. And we needed some categorization information that we edit manually in Google Sheets. So some Google Sheets that say things like, uh, you know, the Sprite Talk webinar is a webinar, uh, and a webinar is a kind of real-world event. Um, for this project, we use uh, BigQuery as a database, and obviously we use Fivetran to sync all of these data sources in. Um, we use Looker as a BI tool to build views and dashboards on top of this data. So our data started out in a data lake schema following the pattern I described earlier. So the data started out in a normalized form. Here I'm just showing a small subset of the tables that are in Fivetran's data lake. Uh, these are just the key tables that contributed to this analysis. Uh, in reality, our Salesforce schema has many other objects. Our Postgres schema has many other objects. Uh, but here I'm just showing the key things that are relevant to this analysis. And as you can see, this is a normalized schema, and it corresponds one-to-one -one with the collections that exist in all of these data sources, Salesforce, Pardot, Postgres, Snowplow. We used SQL to transform this normalized schema into a more user-friendly denormalized view. And this SQL was pretty complicated and involved a lot of steps. So here's one example of one step from our transformation process to get from all these different normalized data sources into a denormalized view that represents all the marketing activities at Fivetran. Uh, this particular query scans the whole history of our Snowplow data, all the page views on our website, and it links individual people's identities to the various devices and web browsers that they use when visiting Fivetran's website, blog, or app. 
This is a classic uh, user identification problem that comes up all the time. Uh, and here we're solving it using a SQL query to scan over the whole history and decide um, which user identities to attach to each uh, device or web browser that we've ever observed. Here's another example of one part of this transformation pipeline. Here we're linking snowplow events, so page views on our website, to Pardot demo requests using the time that the demo was submitted. Um, and it turns out that SQL is a great data prep tool for doing work like this. Uh, SQL is very powerful, it's very flexible, and it's a standard. So lots of people already know SQL. And if you spend time learning SQL and working with SQL, you're learning a standard rather than a proprietary tool that's going to be useful for a lot of things. For these reasons, we think that SQL is a great data prep tool uh, for doing this kind of work to get from a normalized source-oriented schema into a denormalized user-friendly schema. One of the best things about SQL is that because it's source code, you can put it under version control, and you can keep track of how people are changing your SQL over time. So if you have a team of people working on your analytics, uh, instead of everybody uh, doing something different on their desktop and you never knowing the history of what, what's happened, you can have people truly collaborate on source code, a SQL under version control, and you can see the entire history of what happens, and you can apply best practices from the engineering world like pull requests. So when we talk about using SQL to transform your data lake schema into a data warehouse schema, a lot of people get concerned about performance. They think, I'm doing all this stuff in SQL. You know, maybe this is going to be slow. Uh, maybe I need to spend a lot of time thinking about how this is going to work and optimizing my queries, optimizing my warehouse to make sure it's really fast. And one of the things we've seen amongst a lot of Fivetran customers is a lot of premature optimization in this category. When you're designing your transforms, we always advise our customers to start with logical views. That is step one. Um, when you're transforming your data from data lake format to data warehouse format, you should initially just use logical views and see how the performance is. So what I'm showing here in this little wall of text uh, is the complete uh, set of SQL transforms that converts the various data sources I mentioned earlier into a single view of all marketing activities at Fivetran. So as you can see, uh, there's a lot of complicated SQL here. Uh, if you were to zoom in on this, there's plenty of joins and subqueries and aggregations. Um, and uh, what we have found is that we were able to do all of this as logical views at runtime. None of this is physically materialized in our own system. And the reason is that systems like Snowflake and BigQuery are really good at executing complicated SQL fast. Um, you can throw really complicated queries at these systems, and they do a really great job of optimizing through all the layers uh, and executing them uh, faster than you would expect. In spite of the complexity of all these queries and all the data that they're pulling in, every click that's ever happened on our website, the whole thing executes in seconds. And we th I think this is a great example of why you should always start with logical views and only start optimizing performance when you actually observe a performance problem, because you may find that you just don't have performance problems. If you do have performance problems, the first thing you should do is apply date partitioning to your largest tables. Date partitioning is a simple optimization that takes a large table of events in your data lake and divides it up uh, according to the time that the event happened. What this means is that when you write a query like select star from events where the time is greater than something, it can immediately tell which partitions match this query predicate. And it can skip scanning most of the data. That's what I'm showing here on the right. Imagine each of these cells is a partition of a big events table. The gray partitions are all the ones from before January 1st, 2018.
the green partitions are all, are all the ones after. When you have a partition table, the SQL Query Planner is going to recognize that this predicate cuts out most of the data, and it will simply skip scanning that data. Um, Date partitioning is a simple optim and very effective optimization that has very little downside. And so when you're having actual performance problems, uh, this is the very first thing uh, that you should try. Lastly, uh, if you need to, you should pre-transform your data. So if you are having performance problems transforming your data from your data lake schema to your data warehouse schema, then the final solution is to uh, pre-transform the data into a more optimized format uh, in a, a separate set of tables. This is often called materialized views. In this context, uh, materialized view simply means some complicated, expensive SQL queries that we periodically run and store in another table so that they can be accessed faster. There are several tools out there for orchestrating this process. Uh, I've listed a few here on the right. Um, a well-known one is Airflow uh, that allows you to uh, run SQL queries and other kinds of jobs in big uh, directed graphs. And uh, Airflow has a, a simple web UI. Uh, and you can, it can sit there. And when the data sources change, it can rerun these SQL queries and recreate your materialized views for you in your data warehouse. Another more recent tool in this category uh, is a tool called DBT. Um, DBT is a little more specialized for this use case. Um, it has a variety of features that are specifically about uh, materializing SQL queries. Uh, and it has a very active uh, Slack community of DBT users. Uh, so that's another great option in this space. And lastly, uh, an option that I've seen a lot of people use for orchestrating SQL queries is just good old cron. Uh, you can do worse than to just set up a simple little server with a cron tab file that every hour runs some SQL queries that uh, do some optimization for you in your data warehouse. In our own uh, case, we have only had to do one optimization so far. In spite of uh, the many different data sources we're bringing together and the complicated SQL queries we're using to transform the data, um, all of our views are logical views. And the only optimization we've had to do thus far is to partition the snowplow events table. Uh, and this is why we always advocate to start uh, with logical views and don't do premature optimization, because there's a good chance you'll find you just don't need a lot of optimization, and you can just skip doing that work. So uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that one of the best things about the ELT philosophy is that you can just delegate uh, those ENL steps to Fivetran. We are a fully managed zero configuration data pipeline. Uh, we think. Um, 100 data sources and growing. Uh, and in that ELT diagram, we can simply take care of the top half of the diagram, the E and the L. Uh, we can take ownership of the responsibility of delivering all the data and keeping it up to date, of building those data lake schemas for you. And then you can query it uh, however you like to build your own data warehouse model in another schema. We have about 400 customers who have found this to be a great workflow. Um, and if you're looking to put together a new data lake data warehouse, uh, I urge you to give us a look. So in summary, if you're building cloud-based data lakes, there are really three key ingredients. First, you want to choose the right database. You want to use a cloud-based data store that separates compute from storage like Snowflake or BigQuery. This is going to allow you uh, to build your data lake and your data warehouse simply as two different schemas in the same system. Second, you're going to want to start with a normalized schema. You're going to want to load your data into 
your data store uh, without doing a lot of transformation that anticipates the analysis you intend to do later. Ideally, you're going to do this with a zero configuration tool like Fivetran so that you don't have to worry about building and maintaining data pipelines. And lastly, you're going to use SQL to transform your data from your data lake schema into your data warehouse schema. SQL is a great tool for doing this. It's a standard. Uh, you can put it under version control. And because all of these transformations are taking place within the same system, they're going to be really fast, and it's going to be really easy to iterate when you need, when you need to make changes, and you will need to make changes. And with that, uh, I'd love to take any questions uh, from the audience. Thanks, George. Um, I think we've had one come in, um, and someone has asked, what key teams or roles within your organization need to be involved in a data project or like moving a data lake to the cloud? So the kind of key people that should be involved in your organization, um, they, they'd like to know that. Yeah, so um, we see really two patterns with Vicrain customers. One pattern is where you have a team of people who are sort of the data gurus. It's their job to build and watch over the data lake. The data lake has lots of users out within the organization, um, but they're the ones who are responsible for setting it up and keeping it alive. Um, sometimes they're in IT, but sometimes they're not. Um, and so uh, in those organizations, they'll be our main point of contact. They'll be the ones who are keeping track of all the different data sources people want to assemble in their data lake. The other pattern we often see is where marketing teams, uh, who are often the ones that have the most pressing need for a effective data lake, um, will, will come to us on their own. Uh, and because we're so zero configuration and zero maintenance, um, marketing teams are able to build a, a, a really effective data lake uh, and build a transformation pipeline using SQL uh, on their own. So we, we see that as well. Sometimes you know, it's a team of people whose mandate is the data warehouse, and sometimes it's a team of people who are uh, in a specific function and are building a system for themselves. Yeah, that's, I think that's even evident in, in some of our customers and the use cases that we've seen. Um, so that, that's great. I think that, that answered their question. I think another one we have is, and um, again, this is kind of open-ended, but if they're looking at doing um, a data transformation project or, or moving a data uh, lake, what what sort of timelines would would you expect? And again, I know that may differ depending on industry and things like that, but um, any insight into kind of timelines and, and also keeping a project on track? You know, these projects can get done very fast. We've seen people get up and running in a week. Um, are, especially if you have one use case, which is your first and primary goal, uh, like if there's one particular query uh, that you need to be done tomorrow. When you follow this pattern, um, you can get your data lake schema up and running very quickly in a matter of days because our tool is so automated. Uh, and then uh, your uh, you can build whatever is most important first. And that's one of the great qualities of taking this iterative approach where you use SQL to do your transformation. Uh, you can build the most important thing first, and then you can go back and revisit it periodically uh, and add more and more iteratively rather than trying to boil the ocean all in one go. So it, it can be extremely fast. We've seen it done in a couple of weeks. Um, and then sometimes it takes longer. Um, for example, if you're doing a migration, if you're migrating from an existing on-prem data warehouse to this new architecture, um, you may want to replicate all the functionality of your existing system before you do the big move. And so then, you know, it can take it can take a year uh, to do the whole process. So um, I, it can take a long time, but it doesn't have to. Is, is the short version of that? Sure. Um, thank you for that. Um, so actually, we, we're having a lot more questions coming in now. So guys, keep them coming. We have a little bit more time to answer. Um, so one of the questions here is, what are the key differences between Snowflake and BigQuery? I know we've mentioned both of those. And does Wildcrown work with both of these? Um, I already know yes is the answer to that. But maybe, um, yeah. George, you could maybe just talk about the differences between the two. Yeah. Um, 
So we, we do work with both of them. Uh, they're both great databases. Um, the most important feature is the one they both have, which is that they separate compute from storage so that you don't have to plan ahead uh, your provisioning uh, of your system and you don't have to try to design uh, your entire everything you're ever going to want to do up front. Uh, and they so they and they support uh, this uh, data lake schema, data warehouse schema workflow that we advocate for by virtue of separating compute from storage. Um, in terms of differences between them, um, BigQuery is a pure serverless model where you run uh, a uh, a single SQL query at a time. When you submit a SQL query to BigQuery, it just goes off to the BigQuery in the sky and the answer comes back. Uh, whereas Snowflake, you actually set uh, how big a warehouse you want, um, how many warehouses you want, and uh, you can set rules about how they get turned on and off and, and things like that. Um, neither of these approaches is really superior. Um, they just have different trade-offs. Uh, Snowflake gives you a little bit more control over um, you know, uh, cost versus speed. Uh, which uh, can be a good thing if you have a specific plan for how you want to allocate that. BigQuery is a little faster to get going. Um, there's, you know, slightly fewer knobs to turn. But they're, I, I think neither approach is clearly a winner. They just have slightly different trade-offs. And I think for most people, they can look at a summary of uh, those two approaches, and they basically know which one they prefer. Um, so I think it's, a, it's an easy decision for customers to look at. They can kind of... Uh, look at the slightly different approach to pure serverless versus um, elastic uh, customer designated sizes and tell which one is better for them. The other big difference between them is uh, Snowflake looks a little bit more like a traditional data warehouse. It has a little bit more complete implementation of uh, DML and things like that. So people who have been analysts who have been working with systems like Teradata and Vertica for a long time when they uh, land in Snowflake, they'll tend to be, everything will look very familiar. Um, whereas BigQuery is like a little bit of a different animal. Um, if you've not used data warehouses a ton in the past, you may not notice. Um, but there are just a few things that are here and there that are a little different. Again, for anyone who's making a decision between them, I recommend, uh, you know, just try them out each for 10 minutes and you'll immediately know what I'm talking about. If you're one of those analysts uh, who's been using traditional data warehouses for years and years, you'll immediately recognize a bunch of things uh, that are familiar to you. Um, and if, if, and, but um, for other people, uh, they, they, won't, they won't even take notice of that. So the, the best way to evaluate that is just to try them both. Yeah, for sure. That's, that's great. And um, if anyone is actually there considering either of those um, as options for you, we'd be happy to chat to you after. So. Um, yeah, um, let us know and get in touch. Um, I think we have time for like two more questions. So one of them here is, is Fivetron used as an end user tool or more of an IT developer tool? Depends on the structure of your organization. For small companies, it's often an end user tool. So like the uh, head of marketing or someone in the sales department will operate Fivetran. Uh, in bigger organizations, it tends to be more of an IT tool. Some of these bigger organizations, they don't necessarily have anything called IT, but they'll have like a, a data engineering team who, who watches over Fivetran, and they're the primary point of contact. So it really depends on the, um, the size of your organization, whether it's more of an end user tool or a developer tool. Sure. Um, and another question is, is Fivetran a replacement for a traditional ETL tool? So Biotrain is, uh, we're selling a product, but we're also selling a philosophy. We're selling this philosophy of ELT and of using SQL to do all of your transforms. Uh, so in that sense, uh, we are not a replacement for those uh, traditional tools um, like Informatica. We are advocating that you do things differently, uh, that uh, you use Fivetran, which is really a, a self-driving, self-managing system that's going to just take care of that whole first half of that ELT diagram and build that data lake schema for you. And then uh, you use SQL um, to do all of those transformations inside the warehouse 
with all of the advantages that I described. So really, um, in, in this world I'm describing, there is no place for a traditional ETL tool because you're not going to do that outside of data warehouse ETL. Uh, sometimes I say that we're, we're selling a product, but we're also sort of selling a religion about how to build data warehouses. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so actually, sorry, I, I just saw one more uh, question come in. It might be a bit more technical. Um, it says, do you recommend that the normalized schema is composed by persistent tables, like BigQuery tables, or primarily views? So the normalized schema is typically the one that we're delivering because it's the one that corresponds one-to-one -one with the schema from the source. So that's going to be tables. Uh, so that, that's the data we're delivering. That has to be tables. Somebody's got to be tables. <laughs> it can't all be views. Um, so uh, it, uh, the answer to that is that the, that would always be tables. The views are the things that are downstream from that that are getting written by the user. Um, and they, like I said, you should always start with regular logical views. Uh, materialized views are uh, a solution to specific performance problems if you have them. That's great. Um, guys, I, I just want to say, if there's any more questions, please feel free to answer them now. Um, also, we're happy for you to follow up with us and send us email. We will also, um, the information is in uh, the download, which is an attachment. Um, we're always happy to answer any questions or provide demos or further um, information on any of the databases that were mentioned or warehouses today. Um, I want to thank George for joining us today. Um, uh, and again, we would look forward to seeing you guys on another webinar soon. Thanks, everyone. Glad to, glad to talk to everyone today. <laughs>